So it sounds like the, the beeps have slowed down. Just for everyone's background, our, our guest speaker uh, this evening, Molly Murphy, is uh, is still uh, still joining, uh, still working through um, some technical issues to get on the line. Um, so we will um, uh, pause for that. Maybe maybe just in the interest of, uh, of time and not having a silent um, board public here, I'll, I'll give a little background on um, uh, you know, background and intro on the DAB and the topics today and, and, uh, and a couple of other um, more housekeeping type items. Um, so for those who are uh, not familiar, um, you know, we always try to do a, a review of or a, a reminder of kind of what the VA, VAB is, what it isn't, and, you know, limitations and, and, uh, and also what, you know, where we can help. So the Veterans Advisory Board is an 11 member board. Uh, all, all advisory in nature. It's that we're all New York citizens here. That are um, uh, it's not these aren't paid positions or anything like that. We uh, six of us have been appointed by the the mayor and five by the city council, and you know we represent each of the each of the five boroughs and um, and also have uh, you know have a a, a a good spread load of, of people from each of the services as well as uh, a whole bunch of different demographics. And I think we've got a nice. Nice team together in that front. Um, our role and mission is to uh, is to provide uh, advice and counsel to the mayor, you know, and the speaker around really everything related to uh, to veterans affairs or anything that in New York City that might uh, might have an impact on veterans and and hopefully uh, give a voice. Um, we are one thing that we are not is not not technically a veteran advocacy arm. Um, obviously, we advocate for veterans, and we we think veterans are you know, clearly important. We are all veterans. I, sh I should have uh, mentioned as well. Um, uh, but the, one of the guiding principles that we have uh, that we've developed is that we we help give policies or suggest policies and advocate for policies for New York City uh, that that benefit all citizens. And there's lots of smart policies that um, uh, that are, that while targeted at veterans and who the, the typical direct beneficiaries are often veterans. Generally, veterans. Um, there's there are uh, benefits to really all New Yorkers, and as we think about, um, you know, we think about uh, suggesting policies and and advocating for resources and allocating resources. We try to do the ones that are going to have the greatest impact to all New Yorkers um, from a from a process and philosophical perspective. Um, so with that, maybe I'll, I'll ask um, uh, each of the board members to quickly introduce themselves. Um, you know, while we wait for Molly to navigate the technical stuff. So I'm Todd Haskins, Marine Corps veteran, uh, and I represent Manhattan. <laughs> Annette, you want to, we'll pass it off to one another. So I'll turn it, I'll pass it off to Annette. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, yes. uh, this is Annette Tucker Osborne, uh, retired uh, Colonel Army Nurse Corps uh, representing Brooklyn. Hi, John Rowe. Who do you want to pass it off to, Annette? <laughs> She'll pass to John Rowan since I think he's on. Air Force veteran Vietnam. I represent the speaker from Queens. Uh, who else is over here? Uh, who else is on our board? Paul? 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 Paul, you want to introduce yourself? I'm trying. I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> there you go. Hello. Mm -hmm. I see Mercedes. Hello. I know it. Brad Mercedes. He's <laughs> on. Oh great! Now I see Molly's on. Mm -hmm. I'm on. Can you hear me? I'm on. Can you hear me? Hear you just great. great. We're doing quick introductions. Then I'm going to do a little little background, and then we'll we'll turn it over to you, Molly. Okay. Mercedes. Sir. Okay. Sir. Uh, you're on mute, Mercedes. Okay, Mercedes is a Marine Corps veteran, and I remember the Queen. And I remember the Queen. I don't know, is uh, Wendy or Joe on? A lot of people are on by phone. Either Wendy or Joe. Uh, 
Thank you guys, Ron. Uh, may, maybe in the interest of time, I, I think uh, you know, given given the uh, the forum, we'll 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 skip the remaining intros. So um, so uh, a couple couple quick um, sort of housekeeping sort of run of, run of show items. Um, so we're going to do normally we do um, you know whatever the main presentation is of the day, uh, as well as you know then followed by questions. We're going to do a, a two part this time. So um, so our, our guest speaker here, Molly Murphy is going to talk uh, about about housing, um, you know, and some of the history and, you know, we'll go through her, her topic items and then we and then we'll uh, go into questions from there. And, and we'll go into questions from there. Uh, Manny, if you could please mute your phone, Manny Tirado. Th thank you very much. Uh, so, so then we'll we'll pause for questions uh, from there, and then and then that way Molly can can uh, uh, can go on with the rest of her evening, and then we'll hear from the commissioner who's going to talk about um, you know a lot of the specific COVID responses that the DBS is doing, and then roll into questions on topics other than housing and and the topics that uh, that that Molly's going to cover. Um, one quick note, uh, uh, administrative note, as it relates to the next meeting. So we're going to do another virtual meeting on September 16th, and um, and it's gonna focus on voting since obviously there's an election coming up. And we've got the executive director of the Board of Elections is gonna join us. And then the team at IAVA uh, who's been focusing on this, you know, both nationally and New York is, is gonna join uh, and help out with that presentation as well. So hopefully folks um, can join us on that uh, and, and get updated on uh, on activities and, and uh, you know, actions related to voting and, and uh, whichever side of the aisle you're on, you know, the opportunity to just get out the vote. Um, so quickly, let me let me talk uh, briefly, introduce uh, Molly. So Molly Murphy, we're excited to have her with us. She has a long history of public service. Uh, I, I think all of it in New York City or certainly the majority of. She's currently the first deputy commissioner of the Department of Social Services, uh, which has both the Human Resources Administration as well as the Department of Homeless Services among its portfolio. Um, previously, she served in a number of roles within the city council, and she also worked as a lawyer for, uh, for lawyers, at, uh, lawyers for Children, where she represented children in family court, and also as a law clerk, law clerk for the Honorable Loretta Prasca. And so, um, so we're excited uh, for her to join us on the topics of housing. Uh, you know, and especially in light of everything that's going on with COVID and, um, you know, and, and the just all the activities related to that. Um, we've asked for her to cover three topics, just as kind of level set. One is a quick overview of the Department of Social Services, just so everybody understands the overall purview that they have, and it's 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 really quite significant and broad. Um, then she's also going to cover a, a history of the Department of Social Services partnering with, you know, at one point the Mayor's Office of Veterans Fair, and now now the Department of Veterans Services on um, the very successful program called Mission Home, the fight to end veteran homelessness uh, in New York City. And she'll touch on both the ways they've worked together as well as some of the learnings and, and opportunities that they've been able to take away from a lot of the resources that, that veterans bring to the city uh, in that area from the federal government. And then lastly, she'll talk about the current, um, you know, the current situation with housing in New York in light of COVID, everything from some of the recent um, programs that are on that are going on you know as well as hopefully correcting any misconceptions that are out there and uh you know and and then from there we'll, we'll turn it into questions and uh you know and hopefully clear anything up and give people a, a sense of how to how to stay housed and and uh and and really find the best ways to help anyone else who may be in need who uh you know, needs a leg up so with that molly let me uh let me turn it over to you sure uh can everyone hear me Great. Okay. I first of all, I apologize that my video isn't working for some reason. I had intended for you to see me, but um, so be it. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me uh, participate tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity, um, and I want to say thank you to all of you as well for your service. Um, it's it's remarkable. So uh, it's important for us to be here as social services and i say us because my colleague who's wonderful erin drinkwater who's deputy commissioner at dss is also on today um 
and uh, she leads our intergovernmental affairs division and is and is a terrific colleague and is helping with um, tracking your questions and any follow up that there may be. Um, we're always available if there are additional questions after this meeting as well. Um, so as Todd said, there are a few um, main areas that I'll talk about tonight. Um, I will go pretty quickly because as Todd also said, we are a very large agency, as I think most of you know. Uh, the Department of Social Services is, an, is basically the umbrella for both the Human Resources Administration, which is the city's public assistance agency, as well as the Department of Homeless Services. Um, and uh, we have a, about 16,000 employees, about a $12 billion budget. Uh, we administer many programs that are federally and state funded. Um, and we, you know, our mission overall is to reduce poverty and fight income inequality. So um, just by way of a very quick history, because when we did work with um, veteran services on ending chronic homelessness in 2015, um, at that point, the HRA and DHS had not yet been integrated under DSS. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Um, but uh, just to, so that you all understand that we did, uh, when Commissioner Banks was appointed, he was appointed as the Commissioner of HRA and then the two agencies integrated and now we have, um, we have DSS, which is the umbrella for both, as I said. Um, what we just, uh, I know everyone is interested in housing, everybody meaning those of you on the call, as well as many, many others in the city. Um, it is a huge um, and important topic of conversation. Uh, DSS does not have oversight over the housing policies in the city. Um, however, we work very closely with the housing agencies that do, such as HPD, the Housing Preservation and Development Agency. Um, and as, um, as we'll talk about a little bit, we do have certain assistance that's provided to people to prevent them from becoming homeless and going into the shelter system, as well as moving them out of shelter. Um, so, we're going to try to do a live program. Sorry, sorry. There we go. Um, we the, the services that we administer at HRA are cash assistance, food stamps, which is uh, formerly known as food stamps, it's the SNAP program. Medicaid employment programs, we have emergency food programs, we also run domestic violence shelters. Um, and basically since the commissioner was appointed in 2014, we've moved away from a one size fits all approach to more individualized approaches, um, which for example, is to help people who, you know, if they're seeking a job, we're trying to rather than link them to any job, help them find a job that suits their skill set and what, as well as something that they're interested in. Um, we work with many advocacy organizations and legal services providers also to help people um, with, address their individual needs and also identify whether there are systemic needs facing our clients. Um, and then we also establish some many um, individual groups within DSSHRA, including a disability affairs office, which helps ensure that our clients um, are that, that our services are accessible to our clients and um, with disabilities as well as our staff members. Um, something that's notable in terms of uh, some changes made to HRA since 2014 is we did expand homeless prevention services greatly um, and the focus on them. Um, as I said before, uh, it's very important to um, keep people housed um, and prevent them from being evicted, prevent them to, from going into the shelter system. So we do have services such as home base, um, which are offices around the city. Currently, they are operating by telephone um, to help connect people to rent assistance, leave landlord mediation, help with financial counseling, access to rent arrears, um, and that kind of thing. In addition, we also, as a city, um, and it's we have the first under HRA office of the civil justice coordinator who leads the provision of legal services um, and the implementation of the access to counsel bill, which provides um, legal assistance for people who are facing eviction. Um, and so all of those together, we have seen um, some really impressive um, 
results, which, you know, we've avoided um, many people from becoming evicted. The evictions, the percentage of evictions are down in New York City so far. Um, and as a result of the implementation of the Access to Council initiative, and also we have implemented rental assistance programs that are city funded. And with those, we've seen over 145,000 people either avoid um, shelter or move out of shelter. Um, all of these things are um, changed in terms of the way we operate as, uh, as a result of COVID, as you all understand. The services that we provide through our job centers um, are, we consolidated our job centers and now um, we have moved our applications for cash assistance and for SNAP online. SNAP was already online, but given the pandemic, we've moved cash assistance online as well. There is no need, and to the extent that any of you are speaking to people in the community who may be wanting to access our services or who are accessing our services, it's very important to let them know that they do not need to go into a center. It can be done online through our portal access HRA. Um, and that includes applications for emergency grants, such as rental rent arrears. Um, we also, on the DHS side, um, uh, I think as you all know, we run shelters. Many of them are through contract providers for both families with children and single adults. Those in include supportive services and our teams help people access um, assistance to help people move out of shelter, um, as well as help work with people who are experiencing street homelessness. Um, our outreach teams are out 24 seven, 365 days a year. They've maintained um, their outreach during the pandemic and they work very hard to connect people to services and bring them indoors. Um, our shelters have continued to operate in COVID. Um, we have, however, in order to preserve uh, safety of both our um, clients and our staff and to allow for better social distancing. We have moved, um, uh, we have about 13,000 of 17,000 single adults uh, now are have been moved temporarily into commercial hotels in order to um, allow for better social distancing. Um, there are many more things I could talk about, but I'll sort of move on to the chronic homelessness and the chronic homelessness work that we did in 2015 with the great partnership of Veteran Services, um, which has continued. Um, we did, um, you know, as I think you all know, we did, uh, we were able to end chronic veteran homelessness, veteran homelessness in New York City in 2015. We have continued to see, um, a, there's a, a, um, we, a decrease in veterans experiencing homelessness since 2014 to 2019. Um, that effort in terms of ending chronic, chronic homelessness really was a true partnership that included at the time because DHS and HRA were not yet integrated, they were key partners in ensuring that uh, veterans had the access to the services they needed such as cash assistance, such as rental assistance, such as whether it was City, service, city rental assistance or federal rental assistance or other federal supports. We also had the support of the peer counselors at, at, at Veteran Services who were crucial to helping people um, understand what their options are and also help them move out, um, get even things like getting paperwork ready in order to help them go on an apartment viewing. Um, so we really threw a lot of very targeted and very um, intensive um, efforts, we were able to bringing to bear the resources from multiple agencies, we were able to achieve that goal. Um, and we continue doing so after that. Um, I think if there are any lessons learned from that experience, it has been to really try to continue that collaboration in any way that we possibly can. But there are things like CVS that we may not have access to or we may not know and uh, things that other agencies may have that we can connect to through those conversation. It helped a lot to have the federal government support because as you all know, there are also, there are also, um, this is a service available. Let me just jump in. I apologize. If your name is not Molly Murphy, if you could please go on mute, that'd be great. 
particularly if you have a piano in the background. <laughs> uh, thank you. Anyway, we I think that if there's one main thing that we took away from it, it was that collaboration among all of the partners um, was key and crucial and that it helped a lot to have federal support. Uh, we continue to have teams, veterans teams, both within um, our homelessness prevention side of the house, as well as uh, DHS, who are working in and prior to the pandemic had been working in um, three of our shelters that are specifically for veterans. Um, in the spring, they started working remotely to continue to engage clients and providers to process cash assistance applications, help facilitate move outs, help with making sure landlords have their checks processed and so on. Um, so, and then um, although we do have one veteran center on the HRA side for, um, for uh, services there, it's currently closed, but all of the transactions can still be done, as I said, online and interviews are done over the phone. Um, in terms of the questions around housing and evictions, which have been many um, and continue, and, and frankly, the, the, as you probably know, the information that's been out there on evictions has been changing. Um, as of August 12th, um, the chief administrative judge issued an order that no tenant may be evicted until at least October 1st. Um, so the eviction moratorium is still in effect. Um, there are, however, if an eviction case uh, was filed on or before March 16th, which is the pre-COVID period, um, those cases may proceed, but they can only proceed if the housing court holds a settlement conference or a status conference with the parties. Um, and someone who received, received an eviction notice pre-COVID in that pre-COVID period, the landlord has to file a motion and get permission from the court in order to evict that person. Um, so those motions are expected to start tomorrow. Um, and then there would be dates scheduled for court conferences. Um, and so we want to make sure that people know if there are folks out there who receive a motion like that or a warrant of eviction, our Office of Civil Justice can help provide legal assistance. Um, so that is something that I wanted to make sure that everybody on the call is aware. Um, we have a lot of information as well on our, on our website um, and Aaron and I can help follow up afterwards to, to point you in the right direction on those things. Um, so uh, that, is, that is the status of the eviction moratorium. Um, we also wanted to just point out that our Office of Civil Justice earlier in the summer, for example, had presented to the City Veterans Law Working Group, which is run through, um, it's the Fjork Center at Fordham Law School. Um, and they had raised concerns about, for example, certain veterans who may have household income because of the services they're connected to that may put them a little above the income eligibility level, which is 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, and it might affect their eligibility for legal representation. Um, we have provided guidance to our legal providers uh, to encourage them to look at income waivers during the emergency to help people access legal representation if they are in those groups. So, um, and, and essentially at a very high level, what we're doing is if there are people during this period who are um, you know, brought to housing court, then uh, we are trying to link them with legal services to help prevent the eviction. Um, I will stop there. Uh, there's a lot more I could say, but I think those are the the um, the very highest level points. And and Todd and James, if you want to James. That, that's great, Molly. Thanks so much. Maybe one one quick question for me, and I'll I'll, I'll give um, people the opportunity to think about questions that they might have. Uh, um, for what, what are the most common um, misconceptions that you hear, um, rumors in the public or or otherwise about you know about policies that um, either cause people to stay home and not you know seek services that are available to them, or you know or or cause um, you know, problems by just, just them, you know, hearing fake news for lack of a better term. 
Sure. If you're asking at what would what prevents people from seeking services, I think something that you we've heard a lot and we have been making a lot of progress on is that people need to go somewhere to get those services, which they do not during the pandemic. Um, we have also worked, as I said, we've worked very hard. We had our SNAP applications were have been online for some time through Access HRA. Um, we have moved our cash assistance applications online as well. Um, and as I said before, that includes requests for emergency grants, which includes requests for rent arrears. So um, we are tracking how many people we see who may be coming into our centers to seek help um, and trying to make sure people know that they don't have to do that. Um, so, and I think there are, uh, uh, there are understandably a lot of around disability, whether people think they are or are not eligible for certain things. Um, but again, our access to rights rule is a very good one to um, help people uh, to take that. Great, just um, structurally, maybe why don't we go um, first, go to, to people who are joined by video. Um, if you have a question, uh, you, know, you know, maybe unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask the question. And then when we're done with the folks on, who are on by video, uh, we'll, we'll go to the people who are on by phone. Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. Yes, I have a question for Molly. And sure. please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you for your dedication to the community. It means a lot. Now, now you mentioned that to access HRA, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's only only via the portal online. Now, if that is the case, how can a veteran that does not have the technology capabilities yeah. get services? Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Of course, thank you for the question. That's a great question um, and one that we have been asked before. Um, we are able to help people apply if they do not have access to We do have, uh, we can follow up with you with our info line is our hotline basically. And we do have the ability to assist people with application even if, they, if they're not able to do it online. I'm sorry, Molly, I just lost you on the transmission. Would you be kindly to type the uh, telephone information on the chat? They'll be appreciated. Thank sure. you. Or, or yeah, to make sure I give you the right number too, I, I'm happy to follow up um, with um, Todd Apples. Molly, this is Aaron. I can type it in the chat for the folks. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Aaron to the rescue. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Um, any, anyone else on the video who has any questions? And then if uh, oh, not, we'll, we'll move to the phones. All right, John Rowan. Hello. Hi, Molly. Um, I'm just curious how things were going with the COVID and the facilities. How many deaths in Manhattan in the veterans program? Was the um, veterans homes of the real beating run? Yes, we, I do not know how many veterans um, we have, I can tell you, we have not had a higher number of, it depends on what you're talking about in terms of, I have many people ask about homeless shelters. That may, I assume that's what you're asking about. I don't know in terms of veterans. Um, we would have to try to find that out. Um, we do not have a higher rate than others do. And as I said, uh, meaning the citywide rate, and we would have to, what we've been doing, as I said before, is um, moving people out, which we've been doing quickly um, to move them into hotels so that they are distancing and uh, lowering the risk. So I can't give an exact number, but um, we can follow up with you. Hi, Molly. This is Joe Hunt from the Veterans Mental Health Coalition. Uh, you used the term chronic homelessness. Can you tell us what the definition of chronic homelessness is? Yeah, that is, well, for the purposes of the mission home, it was over a year, homeless over a year. 
Um, and then if you bear with me, I believe there was, and it also, there were there was consideration of how many times someone had been in and out of shelter. So, Thank you. And, and I think for background, it, it aligned with the federal guideline and the yes. federal definition thereof, um, which is which is really uh, who provided the certification as well. That's right. Great, thanks. Okay, we're gonna we'll try. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like people are done with the uh, uh, on the video. We'll try with anyone on the phone. So the the process is if you have a question and you're on the phone, type star three, and then I think you'll be able to talk. Let's see if anyone has a from the from the phones has a question. And while that while that goes on, I'll, I'll read one off of the chat. It says, what percentage of New York homeless are veterans and or do we know how many homeless veterans we have in the city in total? Molly, I don't know if you have that. If, if you don't, I suspect that DBS does. Andy. Um, bear with me for a moment. Uh, bear with me for a moment. I'm looking to see whether I have that accessible. Also, Todd, this is James. I can jump in. I, I, I don't have it as a percentage. Uh, the most recent I'm tracking as of last week is that there are 596, um, you know, veterans who are within the DHS system, the Department of Homeless Services system. Uh, as, as of last week, that's what I'm tracking. That is, a, that is, uh, that corresponds to the number that I have. It's about the, about that um, in the shelter system. And we did experience, we did experience for, for from 2014, from 2014 to 2019, there was a 15 in the number of veterans. The number of veterans. Yeah, and for further context, in 2012, which I think is when the program started, there were about 4,000 veterans. So it's it's um, it's decreased quite uh, quite significantly. Just as a reference to give people a sense of what New York City did relative to other large cities. Um, the second largest city in America, Los Angeles, also had 4,000 veterans in 2012. And the last I checked, which was about a year ago, they still had 4,000 homeless veterans. So it's it's really, honestly, it's really a remarkable um, partnership that um, you know that that uh, that New York City has done both you know with with uh, DBS and DSS as well as a whole host of um, uh, of nonprofit partners that have been uh, helpful. Uh, there's a question if the 596 uh, includes any who have gone homeless since or because of COVID, and I, I believe it's it, it, it's that's the last count as of as of last week. So I guess the answer would be yes. There are a certain number of a certain number of those uh, homeless uh, of those 596 have been offered shelter and have um, you know chosen not to take it you know pretty pretty actively. Um, you know, but but uh, I think Joe, I know you're on uh, and the. You know, from the mental mental uh, mental health perspective, you know, unfortunately, these these last 500, it's not the bad. I, I don't know the numbers on on who went homeless recently, but the vast majority of these are folks who are, you know, either refuse shelter or have, um, you know, some challenges that make them not not uh, not willing to take shelter. That's right. I mean, to That's the extent right. that any uh, in the numbers and um, are. Uh, interacting with our um, outreach teams, our street outreach teams. Um, it, part of the work that they do is it's it's uh, many many attempts with the same person to help establish a relationship so that people um, are um, more inclined to accept services and go inside. And then maybe one other question that came across on the chat: um, Are veterans uh, being made aware of HRA programs, SCREE and DRE, D R I E, the rent freeze programs that they may be made available, if, if that they may be eligible for? 
Um, they should be. Um, we have, you know, to the extent that we're doing our work, as I described, generally with our um, teams, both at HRA and DHS, part of their work is to um, ensure that our clients are aware of what's available to them. Um, if any of you have uh, concerns about that or questions about screen injury in particular and um, you know, concerns that people are not being made aware of them, please, please let us know um, and we can try to follow up. As I said too, we have a wealth of information on our website, particularly since COVID, because so many of our operations have, have changed as, as many of yours have as well. Um, and so I, our, our website is a very good resource for folks too. And we try to include include uh, resources on there where they can be directed to other programs, even if even if we at DSS aren't running the programs. Terrific. Uh, any any other questions for Molly from the group? I'll give a pause there, and if if there aren't, then uh, then we will. Uh, uh, if there are no other, sorry, I was just reading another question that came across, but it's not related to uh, to housing issues. Um, uh, so, if there are no other questions from the group for Bali, then then we will thank her for her gracious time and Aaron as well, particularly for saving the saving the day there. Yeah, and thanks, uh, and, and uh, you guys are certainly welcome to stay if you'd like. Um, uh, you're welcome to stay if you like. If not, we'll uh, we'll move on. There's actually one other question that says, do we know how many homeless vets are from New York City slash New York? Uh, um, which I, I assume means like, are they a New York City resident? I, I think they're defined as such when they are when they're homeless in New York. But I presume the um, the question is related to people who may have come here from who may have gone homeless in somewhere else and then have come here because of the um, you know quality of services or what have you. Right. Uh, yeah, most uh, yeah, everyone most in everyone our in system, our system um, even um, if they even come if they from somewhere from else, somewhere. Uh, they have a connection to New York City. So if you look back historic, you know, m most everybody, the vast, mass majority, we get that question before, we've gotten that question before, um, is uh, has connections in New York. So they may have been moving around, but the vast majority are um, are coming from New York. <laughs> Terrific, thanks, Molly. Great, thank you Great. very much. Thank I you very much. It. It. Take care, everybody. Molly, thanks for your time. I don't know if you clap or exactly what what, what you do on a video chat, but <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate thank it. You. <laughs> <laughs> So next, uh, next we're going to hear from the DVS commissioner, who's going to give an update. Um, you know, he'll he'll obviously touch on and be prepared to answer questions around other topics, but he's going to give a, an update specifically on the COVID-related responses uh, that DVS has been uh, has been uh, has been working on, and then uh, from there we'll go to questions uh, at the end. Hey, thanks so much, Todd. And uh, so good to be with everyone tonight. Um, before I go into the details, I just want to make folks know how to reach us at the Department of Veteran Services. Uh, first off, you can always call us anytime at 212-416-5250, uh, excuse me, during uh, working hours, I'm sorry, 212-416-5250. Uh, you can almost email, always email us at connect at veterans.nyc.gov. Once again, it's connect at veterans.nyc.gov. Uh, you can find us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at uh, the handle is at NYC Veterans. And so I'm gonna just start paste, uh, posting things in the chat as I speak so that we all have the same you know, set of information. So anything you miss here, uh, if it's not answered tonight, you know how to find us so they can always be answered. And that's the most important takeaway. And I'm just gonna start throwing stuff in this chat. So. To speak to COVID era things, I want to focus on food, housing, and employment. That's been the main focus for us in this era. But in general, the mission for the department is to connect, mobilize, and empower New York City's veteran community in order to foster purpose driven lives for service members, past and present, in addition to their caregivers, survivors, and families. 
So for us, it's doing everything we can to move the bell curve that is our community to the right, uh, you know, leveraging all that we can, including each of you and fellow organizations and partner entities, just like Molly and Aaron over at the Department of Social Services. And so it's back to food and housing and employment. On the food side of it, there's a program the city has called Get Food NYC, which is available to all New York City residents. If you are uh, in a spot where you don't know what you're gonna eat next, go to Get Food NYC or just nyc.gov slash get food. And you can sign up for that program. We also have staff who are trained to help sign you up for that program. If you need to just call someone at 212-416-5250, we can cover you on that end. Uh, what they'll do is start to send you food in increments of either from as little to as many as 30 day drops of food that's available to you so that you will not go hungry and get food NYC. That's uh, the deliveries are really for homebound New Yorkers. Uh, there's a map on get food NYC's website where they've got over uh, 400 locations where you can go to be able to obtain something to eat through that. And there are other resources there. For instance, nutrition kitchen is something that's actually run through the uh, department of probation. The, the grocery section of grocery stores available to you at least two times per week in various boroughs, not in a grocery store itself, but in a different site where if you needed to get some fresh produce and meat and cheese and things along those lines, that's something else available and that's all tied to Get Food NYC. Um, forgive me, I'm gonna drop these links as I speak. So food, one of them is Get Food NYC. Another one I'm gonna speak about is an initiative that we are coordinating right now with our good friends at the New York State Division for Veteran Services and the state's Office uh, of Temporary and Disability Ass Assistance. And that is the uh, company HelloFresh has been generous enough to donate a substantial amount of meals to the veteran community in the city of New York. The way HelloFresh works is you receive the food uh, and you receive instructions on what to do to cook that food and you have, you have it at home, you cook it yourself. It is fresh uh, and these are perishable meals such that you would receive a bag, which has one bag, has two meals in it. And that meal we've been told has been able to last folks two to three days. And you would have all the appropriate things as far as the right protein there, say chicken, as far as the appropriate starch, say, you know, rice, vegetables, et cetera. And you've got some flavorings there and all the instructions to heat that stuff up. And so that's an initiative that we have also where to tie into that, we're leveraging our great partners uh, from various veteran service organizations throughout the city to get that out to people. So for that, you can always email or call us at connect at veterans.nyc.gov so we can help you connect the dots to make sure that you're one of those veterans who receives that bag or bag with two bags once per week when we are uh, packing it and putting it together. And I wanna give a special shout out to VAB member uh, Wendy McClinton, whose Black Veterans of Social Justice have really done a great job with helping us on the volunteer side with packing those meals, in addition to getting them out to many of her people, along with several other organizations there. So for food, it's Get Food NYC, where we just dropped the, uh, the site for that, and it's the HelloFresh initiative, where you can simply email us at connect for us to, to uh, help you know, type people in on that side. Just gonna type that in too, just hello fresh initiative. I'm typing as I speak, so forgive me guys. And just email us, e just email or call us and you have the information up there. Um, for housing, there are several beats that are available to you to hit for housing. Molly and Aaron are excellent because by being in charge of the Department of Sur Social Services, they if you're a New York City resident and you're in a spot where you say, look, I need money right now. I don't know what to do to get through whatever I'm dealing with, especially for housing and security. Then you would visit many of their sites they have available. I'm going to start dropping things in between what they discussed with the home based program, which is a home based program is if you're having the conversation with yourself saying, I think I may wind up going into a shelter. Home base is effectively a um, it's some think of it as. A guy, uh, 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 something that will prop you up such that you won't have to worry about that issue or financially. It'll set you on the right course to be right by whatever the affairs are that need to be right by so that you're not worried about going into the shelter system. Uh, other programs they have as far as cash assistance, uh, which is available through Access HRA's site. If this is the question of, all right, I need some cash right now. Who, what can I apply for? It used to be called food stamps. 
Uh, now it's called SNAP as far as, you know, uh, subsidies to help with food and uh, other issues where one shot deal is a program where if you're in a spot where you say, I just need money this one time for this one issue and I'll be OK, that might be appropriate for you to apply to. And uh, I'm going to drop some of the links in from Molly's offering. So you've got them. Give me a second, everybody. So uh, and last thing while I'm talking, while I'm putting this in, the Office of Civil Justice is no joke. That's a program where if you are in a spot where you're saying, OK, I have a, a legal situation I'm dealing with with my landlord right now. I don't have enough money to afford a lawyer, but I, I need somebody. Then I would uh, encourage you to visit the Office of Civil, Just of Civil Justice's website, and call them, email them, reach out to them where you have that legal support available to you so that you can make yeah, sure yeah. to be in the right place on the housing front. And, and that's the stuff that the Department of Social Services has. Yes, with its support services. Uh, SSVF is a VA funded uh, initiative whereby there are four nonprofits in this city that if you reach out to them and you say to them, I have issues right now where I need rent relief. I have issues right now where I need help. I'm behind on my utility bills. They haven't cut the electricity off yet, but I owe these people money. Or if you have issues along those lines, the SSVF is an excellent source for you as well. The four supportive services for veteran families providers or nonprofits in this city are Help USA, uh, SUS, a service for the underserved, uh, Volunteers of America, and the Jericho Project. I'm putting all the information in the chat as well. And I encourage any veteran here who's dealing with housing, security, or insecurity issues to reach out to any of our SSVF providers uh, for additional support, additional assistance, and to to our uh, friends in the Department of Social Services as well, just you know, to, to make sure that you are uh, in the right place there. So that's food, that's housing. Last thing I wanna speak to on this front for COVID related things is employment. You know, oftentimes step one of these issues we deal with, it comes down to, I don't have a job or I lost my job or I need to find a way to get a new job. And so if you go to the website for DVS, uh, we have a COVID-19 tab and a resources tab there. We list several different things available to you as veterans. I call your attention to employment. I'm only going to put a few of the many things from that employment tab in this chat right now. But to, to speak to them, one of them is the NYC at Work Initiative, which is sponsored by our friends from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, um, recognizing that about 41 percent of post-9-11 veterans have a disability. Uh, of some sort, and that about 25% of all New York State veterans have a service-connected disability. Um, you know, for those who are a part of the disabled community, this is an excellent platform as far as NYC at work with the job board of employers who are open to hiring people with disabilities. And it's a very user-friendly platform, I highly advocate it. Another one is the Workforce One program uh, sponsored by the Small Business Services Department in the city. Uh, preparation but it has a separate thing just for veterans called Priority One. A former VAB member, Samuel Innocent, is very involved in that project, and that's another group to, to reach out to if you're looking at getting on the job side. Uh, another one that's in the chat is the Onward to Opportunity Program. This is from the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, um, the folks who, who you know, we're very closely affiliated with through our Vet Connect NYC uh, platform. Onward to Opportunity is a series of courses you can take if you need to get trained up online right now to be able to uh, you know, be competitive and certified to go and buy for a STEM job. Highly recommend that program. And then last but not least, another one of our Vet Connect NYC uh, providers, GI Go Fund, has something off the ground called the Empire Vets Program, where it's basically a job matching platform for veterans who are looking to, uh, to, to, to gain employment. There's more under the sun if you go to our website. These are just a snippet of the things on the employment side. We've spoken to, to food, we've spoken to housing, we've spoken to employment. I want to talk about two other things that aren't direct COVID related, but it's important it all ties in. Um, one of them is our Mission Vet Check initiative. Uh, Mission Vet Check is a program whereby we're calling as many veterans as we can in this city to check in on people. Uh, oftentimes, we've got folks who are in our community who you know just need someone to reach out to them to check in on them, make sure they're okay. Just like many of us on this chat do. And so for Mission Vet Check, 
you know, I highly encourage anyone here who's interested uh, to, to volunteer for that. It's asking you to spend some time each week saying, I want to call a few veterans in the city and just checking on folks. And just so that everyone's tracking, 70% um, of our community in this city is older than the age of 55. So we have several members who are a bit older and who definitely can benefit from having the discussion because uh, that's the top thing folks benefit from is just having someone talk to them. And then we've got people who reach out and ask us questions about, you know, uh, COVID as far as testing sites and reach out and ask questions about, uh, you know, financial assistance and who has questions about food. And, you know, it's a great program where we'd love it. If you are able to volunteer and you've got some time, you don't have to go anywhere and just be at the house and it's just picking up the phone and calling someone. Uh, that's the mission vet check. I'm putting that in the chat. There's a volunteer tab or sign up tab on this website. So if you want to volunteer for it, just sign up. And then last but not least, um, as of last month, the Department of Veteran Services, the city DVS, has service connected disability claims. And so, you know, we like to consider ourselves joining a, a group of veteran service organizations and agencies throughout the state that do this type of work because it needs to be done. For those who are interested in uh, having an appointment, which is all remote right now, so we can do this with you in a way where it's, you know, everything's remote. And once we have you with the application, we submit it such that it is stamped from when you actually formally submit and sign with us. So let's say the government is slow right now with uh, adjudicating these things, but. With, with you, then that money will be paid to you effective August 19th. And so, for that reason, we encourage all veterans to fill so, you know, uh, that claim out, especially if you have a service connection. And uh, for that one, you can email us at our generic email address, which is just connect at veterans.nyc.gov. We also have a special address that's just claims at veterans.nyc.gov. So, I'm putting that in the chat too. And so, um, for that, you know, we encourage you not only to take care of yourself. But there are only about 50 or so people on this Zoom right now or this uh, WebEx. If you know someone, please spread the word. So for all these things on the food front, the housing front, the employment front, the volunteer front and the, the claim side, we just ask you to let folks know about this so we can try to help as many people as possible. So right now, I'm just putting claims in the chat. And that's all I've got, Todd, open to any questions you all have. <laughs> Great. Why don't we, uh, first of all, whoever's playing the piano, if you could go on mute again, please, that'd be great. <laughs> um, and then second, why don't we go to the, uh, uh, to the video and anyone who has a question, just go ahead and, uh, you know, go ahead and chime in and, and uh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Hi, it's John Rowan. I just want to uh, tell James, I want to thank Tanya. As a result of the COVID issue, uh, one of my, my Vietnam veteran buddies, in Queens got sick. He got, he's recovering and he had to go to a, a rehab in a, a, a nursing home. But frankly, what it did was uncovered the fact that he's really been not doing well for many years, living alone. And even though he gets out once in a while to some of the local veterans groups, it was one of his uh, long term friends and his wife who went in there and got him out of there and had to, because he had fallen. And the place, he, he was a hoarder, basically. And we've seen this before. People who live alone sometimes, and they, they just fall into strange situations. But I called Tanya, and I got her on the case. And she had guests in there, checking them out. They're going to try to get them some assistance to come in and help them clean and lots of things. So I just wanted to say it worked, but it does highlight an issue that we may not even be aware of. Uh, with this home, with the check system that you're doing when you're calling people up, it's interesting if somebody is living alone, that maybe you need a, somebody to come by and say hello and see how they're doing. Yeah. So much about that, John. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah. While we're waiting for other folks, I just want to, I'm just looking at the chat right now. I saw Lom Song's uh, comment. Hey, Lom Song, how you doing? Um, take a look at some of the things we put out. I've got, I like all of these programs we put here. Um, I think that 
especially the uh, NYC at Work is a great program that uh, the mayor's office for people with disabilities has. Um, because I think they, they do excellent work as well. Very veteran friendly and friendly to those who are in the disabled community. Uh, all the programs are good, but I feel like give some of these a shot and then reach back out to us. You know how to find me and how to find us. But um, I completely hear what you're saying about this is the void right now. You apply for these jobs, you don't hear back from people, you feel like a number and not a name. But um, yeah, I'd encourage you to check some of these out that we've recommended, especially uh, Force Empire Vets, but I especially uh, want to promote the, uh, the one that Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities has. It's excellent. Because um, they screen employers who will only hire folks who have disabilities. So for many of our veterans, this is a good uh, spot. And we'll let you know more as soon as we learn about services, where the department agent has money from the Department of Labor to help connect the dots on those employment situations. So we'll let you learn more, know more about that. But just check these out and come back on the net with us, okay? Hi, sir. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yep, uh, I can hear you. Yes, sir. How, how are you doing? Thank you so much for this um, opportunity and for all the information tonight. My name is Cardi Summers. I'm a student veteran at uh, Columbia. And, you know, I personally have a lot of friends that could, that could benefit from uh, your resources, in particular, the one regarding your uh, your your, uh, your your joint connection with, with regarding VA claims. I wasn't able to get the number or the email that you that you referenced uh, due to the piano in the background. Could you repeat that again, please? Yes, not a problem. The call. Any Thank you know. Veterans.nyc.gov. Okay, so yeah, it's probably my connection. I, I just sent an email, sir. I, I'm sorry, it's probably my connection, but unfortunately, you you were breaking up throughout that transmission. No worries. You got once again. I'll say it one more time. Two one two four one six fifty two fifty. Two one two four one six. 5250, and then the email address is connect at veterans.nyc.gov. Perfect. And anything they need to send initially or sort of just uh, like their VA claim number or just saying that they're interested veteran? Uh, just just need it for the claims, VA claim? Just reach out for the claim side. And we'll make the appointment for that. Just reach out. And this is, you've got the trifecta of being able to help with the service connect disability claims, help for those who need to apply for VA pension. That's something we didn't talk about. For those who qualified, who are interested in that the VA pension, and also for those who on the education side need their certificate of eligibility for schools. That's something else that, that we can uh, help connect the dots on. So just, yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, I see another question in the chat. I just wanna uh, speak to, um, Remote jobs available on EmpireVets.com. I understand that they have been working on that website. As we know more, we'll let you all know, but uh, we've been adamant about having more remote jobs so that for folks who for several reasons can't leave the house right now, um, you can still be able to work. So know that that's something we've been adamant about with this Empire Vets site. Just get going. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, hi, my name is Armando Crescenzi. Hey. How are you? How are you? Hey, I'm all right, Armando. Man. Good to see you, brother. How's it going? Good to see you too. I want to thank you for all, all you've done, and I'm I'm real pleased to see. Uh, I'm real pleased to see that there is a Veterans Advisory Board meeting, even though it's virtual. Uh, I really think uh, I'm so. You know, I sat down. I notified a lot of people. I thought uh, more of my crew would be online this time around. Anyway, uh, all right. I have a couple of questions. You did address quite a few of, of uh, my concerns regarding uh, work. Uh, really, employment is, is the issue for me and uh, my organization. So you know, I work with service disabled vets who operate food vendors and food vendors. Uh, using their New York State privileges under New York State uh, 35A. So we're all out of, as you know, we we prefer the high traffic areas and uh, you know Broadway shut down, Central Park. 
but mm -hmm. you know it's not what it used to be and uh uh so we're, we're all looking and uh, i just i really wanted to say first thank you for the mission check program i have been getting calls uh, people are checking up on me and uh it, 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 i'm really glad about it and i'm sure a lot of vets feel the same way to have somebody checking in on them. now i'm i mean i'm i'm still getting by but as for myself and the veterans and veterans first we want to get we would like to work uh, in some capacity right so there are about 200 of us or 250 of us we're food car operators uh and of course we're connected with commissaries and you know we do have the ability we can produce it quite a bit of food uh you know we're, we're fully licensed and we're equipped and uh, and uh, we really, the kind of help we need is how can we get plugged back in somehow, uh, you know, through the Department of Veterans Services, helping us connect with other agencies like Consumer Affairs and Parks Department uh, to allow us. Uh, I, I want to. We already have special privileges, <laughs> but but uh, there are quite a few prohibitions. Like I was in Orchard Beach the other day. And I think I think there's a few opportunities there where service disabled veteran with a food operation could, could uh, if we could get special permission under the COVID crisis to operate in certain parks because at the moment we're not allowed uh, so far, we're not allowed inside parks but I would love to be in the Orchard Beach parking lot you know or, or thereabouts near to it you know where uh, you know I, I I can get Uber I can get a team of veterans to you know, deliver food into Central Park. And the other thing, the other thing that comes to mind is that uh, the Street Vendor Project, together with uh, uh, Senator Jessica Ramos, they, uh, they're working together to uh, to provide food. Uh, well, I guess the food operators uh, and Jessica Ramos and the Street Vendor Project are operating to get the street vendors to provide food to food pantries. And this way it keeps the vendors employed. I'm wondering if the better services could somehow replicate or borrow or work with uh, the street vendor project or uh, uh, Senator Ramos's office and see if we can, you know, put better food vendors to work that way also. So uh, those are the, I mean, that's, the, that would help a couple of hundred vets immediately that I know. So uh, I, you know, I come to you with my, it's more of a suggestion than a request, but of course there's a lot of work to be done there, and certainly, you know, we, we can't pull it off, you know, we're standing by ready, but we cannot pull it off without the leadership from, uh, from the city and from the advisory board and, and of course the DVS. So, uh, we're standing by and if you can, if you can channel us in or bring us in somehow, uh, we would love to get back to work and start making food. Amanda, I appreciate you putting all that uh, on the table. Let's um, let's you and I keep the conversation going offline. But I just want to say we'll a um, couple of things in response to this. One of them is I, we can't. I can't promise what tomorrow looks like with these things, but we can ask the question to see what is possible because I know that there's a program that the state has where they are using folks upstate to get food downstate for feeding operations and. We can start to do our homework there and have talks with you to check in on that. Um, you know, just let you know what's going on there. And I'll, I've got your email address, brother. So I'll, I'll follow yeah. up with you offline on this. And another one, too, just for the good of the group, uh, for those veteran entrepreneurs who are on this call, if you know any veteran entrepreneurs who are, I encourage you to become emerging business enterprise certified. Um, to be EBE certified is to open up several opportunities for you right now that not to get into details, but it would be akin in this environment to what several of minority and our minority and women owned businesses are able to avail themselves of. And this is valuable to someone who's a veteran entrepreneur who is looking to try to eat in this climate, uh, given what's going on with the pandemic. And so I would encourage folks, anyone who's interested to, um, we even have a web uh, email address business at veterans.nyc.gov to learn more about that. And you can also go to SBS's website. Long story short, uh, for, for whom, uh, 
work for you nor a woman like you are not, you're not a minority woman, you know, but the veteran uh, emerging business enterprise application is something that would be available to you. And that opens up some contracting opportunities. You still have to compete, but it just allows you to have a seat at the table with those things. And so um, what I owe you is I'll email you offline, Armando, so we can follow up and have this discussion about what you're mentioning as far as what's available for the food vendors. And, you know, we'll put the word out. I'll put a link in about the, uh, the veteran-owned business, business, the emerging business enterprise side for the veterans. I appreciate that. Um, does that answer a lot of what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I'm glad That's great news. Vet checking. You look good. It's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, good to see you, too. That's great news. Thank you for the information. Yep. Any other questions from the group? Or from the phones? If you're on the phones, uh, you can press star three to unmute your line. Yes, I have one more question, actually. I'm not sure if this is your field or more so VAs. Um, a, a, a big concern among student veterans is the BAH rate. You know, uh, just I recently started college last year, actually, and, and just separated after 10 years of service in a uh, third ranger battalion. And, you know, uh, uh, honestly, a, a huge point in, in my decision making, you know, it, it was the fact that the BAH rate here was $4,200. And, and, and since the time that I started and now it's now decreased to $3,200. Um, does your organization sort of support or is there any way you guys could assist us veterans as, as the BH rate declines, you know? I'm sorry, and that's Cardi, is that right? Is that still Cardi? Cardi, yeah, yes, sir. And I, I'm going to send you an email um, to follow up. Yeah. yeah that's and that's it's, a huge issue on it. it uh, unfortunately, because that's federal as far as the BH and the post- Bill, that's federal and not touching us. But still, please follow up. We'd love to, to learn more about what's going on on that side. I didn't realize it inclined uh, in that way. So just need to get more facts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Yeah. Okay, we'll do, I'm one yeah. of the most senior I'm dudes at school. Dudes and school. Basically, that's the issue. That's the issue. From, what told, from what I was told, we have to do we some voting at some the voting end. End. But we don't have the time to leave school and vote. No. no. Is that specific? Are you in Staten Island? Do you physically reside in Staten Island? Negative. I live in Manhattan. Negative. I live in Manhattan. I had not heard yeah, of Manhattan. Manhattan. It's my first time here. That one. Yeah. My first time here. That would be <laughs> not good. Got it. Look, just uh, not related to that, and Cartier, please follow up with us. Once again, our email address is connect at veterans.nyc.gov. Uh, for anybody who needs to connect at veterans.nyc.gov. Um, just to uh, mention this as a side note, you know, we're learning that many of our veterans aren't taking advantage of their New York State tuition benefits. And I just want to make sure folks know that you also have something available called Veterans Tuition, uh, the Veterans Tuition Award, a VTA, which is available to all uh, veterans who have served and either, uh, who either have an expeditionary in combat operations. So any veteran who checks that block, a uh, state, uh, you know, tuition award, which is for under. It covers semesters of school for graduate school. It covers four semesters of school for vocational training kept at the highest SUNY tuition for the year. That's just something to put out there for folks who haven't looked at learning don't know about that bro. Um, hey, uh, James, at the uh, commissioner, at, at the outset of the call, there was a question about the um, the utilization rate of the discounted Metro cards for veterans in that pilot program 
um, and I, 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 I know some of the details. I think you're pretty educated on that as well. Do you want to cover that now? Or do you have the details of it? We got to we got to follow up with you on it, Todd. We've got to. Uh, I just want to make sure I've got the right information to get back on that. Um, so for all who know, for these meetings, we uh, make all the questions and answers post meeting public. So it'll be on the website. And I'm sorry about not having an answer off hand. We'll get back to it. We'll get back. And for history, if I recall correctly, and Joe Bello might be on, he may he may even have more details than, than my memory has. Um, basically, the the veterans were um, introduced into a, a pilot program to provide discounted Metro cards uh, for those qualified student veterans. And I think it was uh, I think the program was expanded. It was still a relatively small number. The the caller mentioned 500 out of. Uh, the 12,000 veterans who are who are currently uh, receiving GI Bill benefits here in New York City, um, but but it was you know while that is a small number, some of it I think was more related to veterans not signing up for the program, and part of that was driven by uh, a relatively limited lack of awareness, principally because the you know it was a pilot program and was not sort of fully resourced. The expectation is that the that that program was going to be. Um, expanded and funded, but it's really, it really is going to be a incumbent on the city council to do that, to expand the funding for it. I don't know, Joe Bello, are you on? And did I get that close to correct? We may have lost Joe, but I, that, that's my recollection. Uh, can ask you, I feel like I, I can actually speak to it if you um, find it interesting. The, uh, the, uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct that the original uh, the was that it was a pilot program that was done through DVS in conjunction with HRA. Uh, the situation came up is that um, throughout the tenancy of the program is when there was a lot of communication between the council, specifically the chairman, and the mayor's office of actually removing that income cap for veterans. So we had that initial pilot program. It was also for student veterans were included, but student veterans had to be at or below the federal poverty limit, which is also why a lot of those didn't reflect the larger student veteran populations. So it was the aspect that was a pilot program. So there's the people that we can reach out to in that in that period, but then also the mitigation restriction was still in place uh, during the tendency of that pilot program. Um, and we had to wait until the full launch of it all. Jan well, this uh, January is why now um, the pilot was launched. Terrific. Thanks, Vincent. And any follow-up questions from the, the caller who, uh, who initially had the question? Is he or she still on? I guess he's still on. All right, so Todd, we've got Alan from our team is putting some of the questions that we received in email. He's put them in the chat so we can just one by one um, speak directly to these so we make sure these are accounted for. Um, this first question, for those who uh, just have their phones, I want to know what rights the vets have in case of a citywide layoff for city workers or civil servants. Um, answer that question is um, actually, I want to defer to Dina if she's available, if she wants to speak to that. Uh, Simon, our uh, chief of staff. Hi, thank you, Commissioner. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I, what I would recommend is that you speak to someone in your agency, um, the, probably the HR department. What I would say is that there are civil service rules that do protect veterans with respect to if someone is affected by a layoff where they would um, go on a list. So when opportunities become available, then they would be called from that list. But I would uh, really recommend that you speak to your agency because every situation is different. And so, um, yeah, it's not one case at all. Also, the next question, um, just to read it, I just put a link in, but I see other things coming in. What resources are there for single seniors in employment right now? 
I found support employment for veterans on the civil service examination website. Anyone have a direct phone number to a mysterious alliance? I, uh, I'm going to start with this. Dean, if you want to take it to let me know. I just put the link in for the program that the Department for the Aging has, which is specific to you know employment for seniors. It's a senior employment services program where if you are 50 or older, they have uh, certain money that's uh, allocated to the Department of Labor to assist with employing older uh, people in New York City, let alone veterans. And so, I, Dean, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that one. I, I think I would recommend, again, um, going on the site and also the state website to look at civil service exams, because although we're hearing about layoffs, there are still exams being given, which is an avenue that folks can get into city service. But also one of the things that I know we've been talking about internally at TBS and the city has been talking about is 65A. Um, that is another avenue for folks to enter um, government and those are special programs. Um, so that's what I would recommend, um, checking out the city's website um, as well as the state um, to look for uh, um, civil service exams that may fit for someone's skill set. Got it. And I want to go to the, um, the next question is, uh, housing without dangers of directly without being bound between nonprofit orgs is it true that flag to veteran grave sites no longer be available to veteran or use at Memorial Day and if so what reason um so peaceful peace peace, peace. Uh, first one for immediate affordable housing uh, there are we just put a host of links on the site for things that you can look at as far as alternatives to winding up in the shelter system. I, I namely want to call out the home based program and the uh, one shot deal program as far as, you know, uh, opportunities to be able to have the financial backing and the SSV programs too, the supportive services of veteran families for folks who say, look, I, I need the help. I don't, I'm not in the shelter right now, but I need the help. And so that's one that we've got. Um, as far as bounced around between nonprofit organizations, um, for us, it, uh, the best response I can say to that is we really are one team, one fight here and working with all of our different partners. Um, and so instead of trying to be all thanks to all people, um, we very much leverage our friends at the Jericho Project, at SUS, at uh, you know, Volunteers of America, at uh, Help USA and other organizations and uh, Molly and Aaron, who were just here from the Department of Social Services. So we do. You know, we do make those referrals to folks who will uh, not drop the referrals. Uh, and then the next one, um, flags for grave sites, veteran organizations. Um, it is true that flags for grave sites no longer be available. That is uh, that is not true. Uh, flags for uh, veterans for Memorial Day has been occurring through this agency for years. And what we're looking at is ways to leverage partners to make sure we can continue to stick that landing and have flags available for folks. So for us, we are actively uh, speaking with others in the city to see if there are any other groups and organizations that would be happy to kind of help make sure that we continue to have flags to honor our veterans uh, for Memorial Day. So it's not that things are going away. It's that, you know, we just want to make sure we're being smart with opportunities, with resources and leveraging everything around us. Um, anybody have any comments on that one? And we'll keep pushing through some of these questions. All right, let's go, let's go. I'm just looking, let me see. I, and I don't know if any council members are attending the VAB, Armando, I don't know, you know, they'll message you or come online. If you um, host NYC. I had to ask. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, for the Get Food NYC question, I'm gonna repeat it. I'm gonna. I saw a post on Get Food NYC for veterans, and what the program was about, and what would qualify as a veteran in need of these services. What is the procedure like, and how does this work? Um, happy to turn this over to anybody on our team from DVS who wants to take a crack at this. Otherwise, I can give it a go. Uh, anybody on Team DVS want to give it a shot for this answer? All right, well, I'll give it a shot. Um, Get Food NYC is a program I think 
maturity. You have that next year for seven days to 30 days. And at the end of that 30 day period, you just say, hey, I want this food. Um, a, for homebound veterans, Get Food NYC ensures that someone will deliver food to you if you cannot go to a place yourself. B, for those who are not homebound, there is a host of over 400 sites where feeding is occurring. Uh, everything from schools to pantries where you can be able to access food. The website is www.nyc.gov slash get food. So it's get it's www.nyc.gov slash get food. And it's not something exclusive to veterans. Anyone who is in this city can access it. What else have we got? Um, I got to see you. Yeah. Whoever has got two devices active, I'm sorry, but you're creating a feedback loop. Yeah. Commissioner, uh, can I just add something to that? What you just mentioned, I'm sorry. It was hard to hear you with the feedback. So with the with the food uh, security that DVS is doing, we are actually processing that those orders straight to our veterans and their families' homes. Uh, the other thing I want to add and just give a, a short update. Uh, we, for the time being, no more 30 days. For the time being, it's two weeks. But get in touch with our office and we will process your order for that veteran. Thank you so much, Tanya. So I'm looking at this chat right now myself. Uh, Vince, can you do me a favor and read the um, the other question about the benefits for families of fallen soldiers? If you can read it, just so I don't have to look for it. Yeah, please, sir. Um, I think we have um, uh, Mr. Teaser. You mind if you would like to? I see that you're on video. I think if you'd like to jump on there, if not, I can read it for you. Um. Yeah, just as uh, if we can discuss the benefits or resources for families of fallen soldiers. Understood. So let's start with, and mind you, this is uh, this is what I'm talking about when I say one team, one fight. This isn't all uh, a New York City show. This is really a New York State show, and in, in cases, uh, you know, a U.S. government show. Um, just a few things I'll speak to briefly. There is a Gold Star Parents annuity, which is something that the state provides as far as an annuity payment for Gold Star families or parents. Excuse me. Who reside and are domiciled in New York State. And uh, each year, the amount of the annuity payment increases in accordance with the annual cost of living adjustment. And so uh, you don't need to be a member of a Gold Star Families organization to receive that. Let me see what else I can find here. Uh, there's also, as far as survivors' benefits, speaking at the federal level, there's the VA dependency and indemnity compensation. And those payments are available to eligible spouses, uh, unmarried children under 18. Uh, and certain children pursuing higher education, uh, children with disabilities and dependent parents of veterans whose death was service connected. The benefits are typically discontinued upon remarriage. So if you're a spouse and your uh, partner passes away in service, that benefit is available to you until you remarry. And the annual income of parents is an eligibility uh, factor for parental uh, dependence, dependency and indemnity compensation. Uh, then there's also the VA's the, it, the death pension that the VA has, and this is for surviving spouses and children of the deceased veterans who survived who served during a wartime era, may be eligible for a death pension. And the amount of the monthly payments typically depends on the monthly income and net worth. And uh, minor children may be eligible even through spouse, even if the spouse does remarry for that one. There's, for this kind of information from our our friends at the New York State uh, Division of Veteran Services, and they have. Uh, some paperwork that has this info. We'll make sure to get this out uh, for those who need it to access it. But this is, you know, I hope that kind of answers that question a bit as far as those opportunities. And if anybody wants to add anything from Team DVS, please jump in. Tanya. Hi, this is Angela. Tanya, can you add on the, about the um, spouse's benefits if possible? I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm sorry. Yes. So I put it in the, I put it in the chat box, but the DIC is very important. Uh, the 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 pension very important. Um, chapter 35 benefits are what the surviving spouse and children will go to school. Moving. Chapter 35, and so it's very important. You're reestablishing your life after such loss 
And it's very important that we connect our veterans to their own benefits. Otherwise, it's pretty, it makes it pretty difficult to connect the spouses. And I know we have some, uh, and also dependent children, not just the spouses, but dependent children. We can't forget about them. And also, I know we have some uh, state team members on the call right now. I saw a few, but they would be able to get a, give a, a huge in-depth. But I myself have used these benefits. They are real. And I want to encourage everyone to get in touch with our office, get in touch with us, and let's go through the details of how we make this happen. Mm -hmm. Call us at 212-416-5250. And um, yeah, just adding what Tanya said, there's also the educational benefits for widows, widowers and spouses. She's absolutely right. Um, so if you have further questions, you know where to find us. So spouse um, benefits also include, correct me if I'm wrong, Tanya, it's been a while since I had my training. <laughs> Those spouses include um, long-term care facilities also. It depends, it depends the percentage of the veteran. Right, and I believe the the age limit um, is fifty seven and a half, and then the spouse can remarry. Exactly. Yeah. Re remarriage is a big thing, so as you can see. All right, so for this, this other question, I'm looking at number five on what Alan's posted. Where we got an email was. Um, in January, the agency hosted a co-sponsored training event for a number of NYC therapists to certify them in the Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories Protocol that treats PTSD symptoms. How does a veteran find one of those therapists and will there be a list available you can share with the veteran community? We will, let's circle in-house and then come back on the net with that because that is something we can make available as far as that information. And um, Melissa Walters from our team, is really our point person there. So that's something we can definitely get back to you on. And thank you so much for whomever asked that question. Okay. Um, what else we got? What else we got? Vince, help me not miss anything here, man. Let me just go to six right now. It's so much on there. Um, okay, it's a Metro card question. Uh, Vince, you want to take this one? Yes. Um, so this is, uh, I, I think this is just based on our, uh, so we also had with, um, with uh, the Senator Haskins, just DC, uh, it was a pilot program at first, it's important to have a way to it, uh, but the program is not out, and that's the discrepancy between pilot program numbers compared to the overall student population. So the reason for that low so that larger group is just simply that uh, it's a pilot program versus the yeah, launch, and launch program begins. So, so the veterans, the vault, as well. Okay. All right, I'm Jack. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not actively talking, please mute. It does make it difficult to hear for everybody else. All right, I know it's a lot in the chat. I feel like for the military friendly designations, it's not really a question, but a suggestion. And thank you so much for that. Let's, I just want us to suggest this and then circle back. Once again, for all information as far as the Q&A of this and a transcript from this, this stuff is made available publicly after the meeting. And so for us, we'll circle back and put together the right responses also. So we can be able to give the right respect to the question. So even if we don't answer a question right now, know that we're going to go back through this thing with a fine tooth comb and make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, yeah. So I see you as far as the military friendly designations comment, Alan, you received uh, in the underutilization of student veterans comment. I see you on that. I just want to say that we'll respond to those in depth uh, on the tail end of things. And just a comment on Skillbridge. I'm looking at the underutilization comment. Um, the issue with Skillbridge is it's best when it's near a town that has or, uh, a town that has a major military base is able to take advantage of Skillbridge much more effectively than a town where you're good a ways away from an active duty base. 
Skillbridge is basically the first 05 in your chain of command will allow you to spend time away from work as a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, and go in moonlight working at, at a potential employer whom you might work for once you finish service. And so if we were next to a very large active duty base, Skillbridge would be great for us to benefit from because that soldier at, say, Fort Drum could just, you know, have a quick commute to spend a few with their employer. However, because we're so far from a large installation, because if you think about it, Dix is a reserve site. Uh, Fort Hamilton is a reserve site. West Point is a small site and it's very far away. It's it's hard for us to leverage it, but it is something that, you know, we, we look at these things as far as, you know, ways to take advantage of student vets and to amplify them and help them connect dots. But like I said, we'll give a more robust response to this on the back end, guys. Okay. All right. Any other questions, everybody? I'm still looking through this thing. Any other questions? I want to. I want to speak to something. I, I've got one privately. I want to speak to also. This is something we're working on with our partners at the office uh, of the uh, chief medical examiner's office. The uh, question was basically saying, it not just about, about COVID, but in general. We need to make sure that, you know, when a veteran passes away, that whomever writes, uh, fills out their death certificate. And John Rowan, you'd appreciate this. You and Paul, whoever fills out their death certificate, make sure that if there's anything that that cause of death was tied to a service connected disability that is reflected on the certificate. Because if it is, then it makes it that much more possible for the dependency compensation to be remitted to the family. And so, you know, it's an excellent question. It's something that we are looking at with our partners at the Office of Chief Medical Examiner as far as sure that when someone writes a certificate, if there's any way that that death was linked to something that was a service-connected disability, that is captured because that is doing right by that veteran's family. So I just want to acknowledge that. Joe? Yeah. We also need to add that if if the uh, passing was COVID related, that any other medical conditions would have been underlying. So let's just remember that uh, there's a way, there could be a way to service connect. Uh, we need to take a closer look, a deeper look yeah. at the yeah. cause of the passing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Agreed. But if, but if a veteran's you know say dying of of Agent Orange in a veteran home, and is in the hospital obviously for months, but then three days before he gets COVID, he's going to be signed off as a COVID death COVID. and not an agent. Yeah, and, and that's the problem because now what's happened? They write it on the death certificates. The families uh, will have a very hard time trying to collect their service benefits. Collecting money. That, that's the issue where the education is needed is, is to be able to talk to folks to make sure that they're writing it in a certain way where it, yes, you know, it's, it's supposed to be COVID in relation to blank is what it's supposed to say in, in that case and and so that this is the nuance we got to make sure people are educated on yeah I've been told from the VA that they are going to look favorably on the COVID thing knowing that was the reason why it was that, that they died also, if they've been a hundred percent disabled, I think for more than ten years, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, ten years. Get hit by a bus. Ten years. I'm gonna get the DIC. Yeah, I understand a lot of this stuff. You know, so some of it's been around a long time, and this disabled a long time. So you fall into the category. The uh, yeah. chapter thirty-five in the uh, in the Honey, money's children money's issue is a big deal. You know, a child could be an adult who happens to be um, disabled or um, a, a real dependent. Even have a dependent parent. Somebody younger. I may have had a parent. It's an awesome. Can, can everyone please mute if you're uh, not speaking right now?
All right, Armando, your question about the links in the chat. Usually what we want to do is have the chat available on the website. Uh, we'll connect the dots to, to, to make sure that we can have this information on the website. This and our answers to questions, too, so everything is covered. Um, yeah, I'll commit on the website, but yeah. Yeah, this is this is Kwame. Um, I just wanted to jump in. I, I just wanted to ask Todd if, if possible, um, in addition to what the commissioner just mentioned, um, can folks, um, since it's the VAB meeting, reach out to you or Joe Bello to provide, um, you know, these links? We can provide that to you guys in addition to what we'll put on our website. Just want to make sure that there's different avenues of communication as well. Is Joe Bello on the line? Joe, can can they reach out to you? I don't. I don't think he's on the line. Okay. Well, in addition to what the commissioner mentioned, what the commissioner mentioned. I just wanted to make sure that there's different make sure that there's different channels of communication. Channels of communication. Yeah, and just just to to echo that point, the um, you know, I, uh, you know, a couple of observations. One, you know, we, we aren't uh, city employees, so there are limits on what we we can functionally do, but we'll certainly do everything we can to help and and steer people in the right direction. Um, each of our uh, email addresses are, are located on the website, uh, on the DVS website, and they are all they all follow the same convention. Con yeah, convention. So, official last name VABNYC at gmail.com. So, mine, for example, is T Haskins VABNYC at gmail.com, and, and and literally every one of us follows that same convention. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'm saying to your question, does NYC offer any financial aid for veteran students? It, it goes back to the program I mentioned before, and it's not city, but it's really a state with things like if you are out of state and you are a student who decides to attend school in, in the SUNY or CUNY systems, you're able to pay at the in-state rate, right. or that they have this veterans tuition award, which can help cover, um, you know, really the cost of school uh, while you're there. As far as the the closest things we've seen offered by way of financial aid for for veterans and once again that's not city that's that's our friends at the state And then, I'm sorry, Joe, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your question. Does a medical examiner report veterans' deaths by suicide and overdose, and can we break it down by era, gender, et cetera? We're in talks with the medical examiner about that issue as well to try to get this type of information and to get an idea of not just having the raw data, but how we can read the data is, you know, so that we can actually um, see what can be done to learn some things from it, and it takes steps to make that info publicly available. So I just want to, to acknowledge that question. Very good question, by the way. I mean, all of these are great questions. So, barring any other questions, Todd, I'm, uh, you know, you know, floor is yours, my friend. Thank you so much for just Thank this opportunity so for, to, 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 to know how to find us. We have our email address, which is veterans.nyc.gov. You have our phone number, which is 216-416-5250. And you know how to find us on social media, which is the handle is at NYC Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, sir. I look forward to September 16th, where we'll have the, in partnership with IAVA, as well as the Executive Director of the Board of Elections, and we'll talk about about elections and getting people signed up to vote. Hey, Todd, I'm sorry, it's James. Todd, one last thing I want to say, just want to kiss the rings on the entire DBS team. Um, as far as being the wind beneath my wings, this wasn't just me talking. This was all of us putting it on the table to just make sure we got this information here. And all those phone numbers and emails, they go to our people who do incredible work. And I just want to say thank you to you all, to, to Team DBS. And, and, and also, once again, thanks so much for the, to the VAB for allowing us to, to be with you tonight. Thank <laughs> you.
All right. Well, I, I, I think that adjourns the meeting. So uh, with that, I hope everybody has a great evening and I look forward to seeing you next month. The only other thing I'd say is if you have feedback on these, other than uh, technical stuff, we know we need to improve upon. But if you have any other thoughts on other topics or, or um, you know, other objectives, our, our goals are to get information out to the public and also get feedback from folks as to what what's on their mind. And so that helps us, um, you know, helps shape policy and helps think through what the, what the best recommendations are on our end. So thanks, everybody.